you put the bat okay. as well. It's okay. <laughs> I'm allowed to not just print. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Juan, for uh, organising the event and for having me to, to kick things off tonight. I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to be talking tonight about something called the grammar of graphics. Um, and Juan mentioned that, uh, that a lot of the stuff that I like to do around visualisation is backed by sport. And sport happens to be my passion. So I'm going to start tonight by talking about passion. So. I came from London City Airport this morning, uh, and I left my house not really expecting anything big to happen. Um, but then it turned out my, my cab driver on the way told me that there was quite a lot going on at London City Airport this morning. So my colleagues who are coming to the Bistry event over the next few days all through from London Heathrow, which was absolutely fine. But uh, there was quite a few people that decided that this morning was going to be the morning that they would try and close down London City Airport. And all of these people were extremely passionate about the environment and climate change. And it's part of an ongoing movement that uh, is, is headlining a lot of the news stories today. So one person was even passionate enough to actually go up the steps, he bought a ticket, he, he went up the steps of the plane, and he glued himself to the top of the plane so that it couldn't take up. <laughs> you can enjoy the photos of that coming out either today or over the next couple of days. So I'm going to start by getting a bit of energy in the room. Um, it's called the mmm test, and basically I put a few photos up here about some things that people might be passionate about. So I'm going to ask you, uh, when I kind of describe what's, what one of these photos is, if you feel like it's something that you're passionate about, just to give, give us an mmm, and then through the sense of the sound in the room, we're going to get a bit of a feeling for what other people's passions are today. So first up we've got dogs. Who's passionate about dogs? Give me a mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Moderate passion. Uh, what about shopping? Any passionate shoppers? Give me a mmm. There's quite a high pitched mm. <laughs> Reading, have we got any bookworms in here? Mm. So there's lots of readers. <laughs> what about travel? This is quite a popular one. Who's, who's passionate about travel? Mm. Even more so. Photography? <laughs> and who's passionate about passion fruit? Mm. <laughs> Great, so there's lots of passion, lots of diverse passion in here. For me, as, as Fran's already mentioned, uh, sport is my passion. It's something that I kind of grew up doing. Um, I like watching sport, I like playing sport. Unfortunately, my passion isn't necessarily matched with my talent. <laughs> Unlike this guy, who is very attractive, but is not me. Uh, so he is a, the England Rugby Sevens captain, and people have often said that he is a better looking version of myself. <laughs> As I said, passion and talent don't always go together. So in this instance, I wasn't talented enough to become a professional sportsman, an F1 driver, a footballer, every little boy's dream. Um, but I started to find out that what I was quite good at was visualisation. And so I was able to combine my interest in sport, my love of Formula One, and as Juan mentioned, and I know they're coming to Amsterdam in a few weeks' time, Chelsea. Uh, and I was able to combine them together, and it really has helped me learn things like Tableau. So before, about two and a half years ago, I started using Tableau. I was using it in a business context. I used to work for uh, EY. Um, but what really helped me get through it, and this is kind of one of my big messages today, was after learning the basics, going on and, and watching videos and actually understanding how the software worked, the thing that kind of pulled me through some of the deeper projects where you have to spend a bit more time, you're know, kind of up at night, was my passion, which was sport. And that, that's something that I think everyone here, we've already kind of touched on some of your passions. It's about going out and finding that data and actually turning it into something uh, that you're proud of. And on that process, you will actually feel more inspired to, to go through and keep on learning about it. So that's, that's what I did uh, on my journey with Tableau, and it's also what I did with my journey with R. So I've got a lovely Venn, Venn diagram. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle of this. I was using sport to kind of take myself through uh, how to use Tableau. Not, not necessarily the, the, uh, the basics of it, but the actual kind of pushing more of the, the boundaries and that, what ultimately actually led to kind of becoming the public ambassador and trying different things that uh, I can tell you, it did take a, a very long time to kind of track, uh, crack and work out in my own head. 
So this was a, a recent project I did uh, using Tableau. It was taking a sport that I wasn't really familiar with, um, which is cricket. And there was a lot of enthusiasm in, in England for cricket over the summer because of the, the World Cup. It was hosted in England. They were one of the favourites. So I thought, I'll take this as an opportunity to actually try and explore and understand a little bit more about cricket. Um, so loads of stats in cricket. And one of the, the, the main things that they throw up on the, on the screens or after the game, people look at it. And it's the, it's the cricket scorecard. So what I wanted to do was to take that and try and tell the story of the match, what was going on, using some charts that would actually try and uh, get people enthused with it, with the game and, and understanding those stats. So at the bottom there, we've got an idea of when the, the wickets actually fell during the game, so when people were bowled out. We've got runs at the top showing uh, when the peaks and the troughs of the actual uh, runs were being scored by each team. And then, I think this is one of my, my favorite charts. I use it in a lot of different contexts, but it's showing the, the kind of cumulative trend, so the ebbs and flows of how the game was actually taking part, who was in the lead at a particular point in the game, and so on. Another quick example, uh, this was when I was trying to uh, learn how to do several things with, with R's ggplot. So ggplot, for those that don't know it, it's, it's R's visualization package, uh, the main one that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about today. And uh, it's, it's quite fiddly when you're actually writing out the code, but once you get to know it, it's, it's a really powerful tool, and you can turn it into these kind of graphics, which you'll see a lot of in things like the, uh, the Financial Times and The Economist. Uh, and it, it really allows you to get down to the detail of actually every <coughs> single line of uh, editing your graphs. So that leads me nicely on to what I'm actually going to talk about now that we've got the passion out of the way, which is the grammar of graphics. So I'll start with a quick definition of grammar so that we, uh, we're all on the same page. So I looked up grammar, I typed it into Google to, to see what it came out with, and this is, this is what it came out with. Pretty long definition with at least three or four words in there that I'd actually have to go away and Google what they meant if you didn't actually study some kind of English literature. But luckily for me, Google had a... People always ask, what is grammar in simple words? <laughs> underneath. So, in, in essence, grammar is the study of words, how they are used in sentences, and how they change in different situations. And while I was reading this, something actually stood out to me, which is that it's the craft of letters. So, it's the, when you're writing sentences, you're crafting words and you're crafting um, speech to actually tell a particular story. And that is the approach that I think that the grammar of graphics offers to uh, visualization. So we, we won't dwell on this one, but in essence, you're breaking down the sentence. Um, this looks fairly complicated. I didn't actually properly engage with this particular chart. But it's an idea of when you, when you read through a sentence, it is actually formed up of lots of different concepts and, and uh, structures and grammar. The grammar of graphics, as described by Hadley Wickham, who's a bit of a godfather in the R community. He is uh, not the creator of the grammar of graphics, but he has kind of popularized it through his packages in the tidyverse. Uh, and his definition is that a grammar of graphics is a tool that enables us to concisely describe the components of a graphic. Now, he's got seven different stages in that grammar of graphics. So we go all the way from data to the final visualization. And that is the structure that we're going to take now. So to do this, uh, I've, I've, the next seven slides are all going to look exactly the same, so they're nice and familiar. <coughs> we're going to have, on the left-hand side of the screen for you guys, the grammar, the actual sentence that you would call in R to get the uh, particular uh, response. You've got the data source, uh, the, the picture that's come from Tableau. So this is the kind of visual analytics that you can understand and see. So this hopefully is familiar to, to many of you. And then in the hashtags there, we've got a bit of a description. Um, so when you run a line of code in R, it's got a hashtag before it. It means it's commented out so it doesn't actually run through the console. So, and you also notice that the hashtags are all terribly polite and British. <laughs> So first off, we've got our data. We load our data in. Uh, in this example, uh, all of the code is going to be used from a, a recent Makeover Monday, which happened to be on sports, and obviously I felt like I needed to get involved. Um, and it's all about the player stats behind Arsenal Football Club for, for last year. 
Next up, you've got the geometric form. So in, in R, you're just writing out a particular geom, so it's shortened to geom, and <coughs> where you can choose whether you want it to be a bar chart, <coughs> a line chart, circle chart, whether you want to print text onto the screen. And there's two ways of doing this in Tableau at the moment. When I started out using Tableau for the first time, I found Show Me a really, really useful um, tool for actually uh, running through different types of visualization so that I could see the same information but show in different ways. But having used it for a few years now, um, I very rarely use the Show Me button. Instead, I try to build my visualization from the ground up using the marks card. So when you click on something in Show Me, you'll see that the marks uh, and what you've got on the columns and the rows will, will change based on what you've uh, you selected to actually show. So the, the geometric form is how you actually decide to represent the data, whether you want it as a bar, or a circle, and so on. Next up is the, the mapping. So the important thing within R here is the AES, and that stands for aesthetics. And that's where you choose which bits of your data you actually want to take from the, the larger data set and you want to plot and, and actually visualize to understand the information. Again, Tableau. This is about what you want to have on your columns and your rows, on your X and your Y. And then the second bit here is applying some kind of uh, visualization technique. So whether it's uh, using color or using size um, to actually supplement that information. So in this case, we've got the statistic, uh, the, the number if you want, on the columns, and then the category or the, the uh, dimension on the rows. Next up, you've got the statistics. And this is more about the analysis that you're doing. It's not necessarily a visual thing, but it's uh, deciding whether you want to see your data as a sum, as an average, as a min or a max, or whether you want to count it or distinct count it. Um, and this is allowing you to aggregate the data at different levels, and that's going to therefore allow you to see the information in different ways. Next up, you've got the position, and this one is less well used in Tableau. This is more of an, an R thing. This is, uh, for example, if you, you've got a bar chart, and instead of having it as a, um, a bar chart where you've got all the different categories on a single row, it's whether you want it stacked um, or aligned next to each other. And quick Tableau tip on this. This is something that I learned a bit further on in my Tableau journey. <coughs> this chart here, the bubble chart, it's one that uh, people use a lot when they first see Tableau because it's not something that you can get <coughs> straight out of the box in some of the other tools and it looks fancy and um, you know, everyone loves bubbles. So you see this one a lot when people are starting out and I'm not necessarily condoning it as a, as a great visualization choice. But I think the best description of how you can use position in your grammar of graphics is deciding whether you want them outlined like this or if you want them stacked on top of each other. So. Quick Tableau tip, within Tableau you can go to that analysis menu and you can go to stat marks and usually it's defaulted as on but you can turn it off and you'll get something that looks kind of psychedelic and CD like on the bottom right. Next up you've got coordinates. Now this is something that is much more easy to do in, uh, in R than in Tableau. So in R it's a simple line. Usually when we're creating graphs, we are creating them on a, a Cartesian coordinate system where you've got an X running down the bottom and a Y running up, up and down. Um, but by changing the actual coordinate system, you can think about creating radial charts, such as this one. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's much harder to do in Tableau because it kind of involves taking you back to high school maths, um, where most people didn't understand it in the first place, but um, there's loads and loads of blogs out there now, and there's even templates that will allow you to actually dig in, understand how these are built, and these can be a really effective uh, chart choice when people talk about bar chart fatigue. It's, it's really great for drawing the attention um, and getting people to dig in and understand what the information is. Last thing on our grammar of graphics is faceting. So, Again, this is quite an easy thing to do within R. It's, uh, you've got the, the line facet wrap or facet grid, and that's going to allow you to dictate whether you want your same visualization but spread over lots of different categories um, so that you can actually start to compare things visually side by side, clicking between them, starting to see the trend over time, um, where in this case, Lionel Messi kind of moves from a, a right wing position into that central position that he played under Pep Guardiola for quite a while. So it's interesting to see his, <coughs> this is his touch map over uh, 
10, uh, 12 seasons. See how that kind of moved towards the center and then gradually moved back towards the right wing. And then finally, bringing it all together. So we talked about sentence structure earlier, and I think one of the, the biggest things that R taught me about using Tableau was to think about it in a completely different way to just getting a graph. It really allows you to break it down line by line. So you we're calling the plot, and for anyone, uh, I, this was new to me, but the GG does stand for grammar and graphics in GG plot. Um, you've got your plot, you've got the aesthetics, what you're actually mapping the data to. And again, <laughs> mapping data isn't something that you necessarily <coughs> think of in Tableau, but as soon as you have to start writing it down and understanding what's going into each single line, uh, it becomes much clearer, the concept of mapping data to pixels on, a, on an X and Y canvas. You've then got some formatting, and you've got your uh, coordinate scheme, you've got your faceting, your, your small multiples. And then the final one, which I'll touch on in a second, is, is theme, where all of the uh, tidying up goes on. Basically. So, similar to, to when you're writing a paragraph of text, this, using the plus as well, kind of brings it all together. And you can see it's quite nice having the actual finished visualization on one side, and the text of what's created that realization before. And that isn't always something that comes naturally to tablet users, I don't think. Definitely didn't come naturally to me when I was starting out and, and creating stuff. But even if you're not writing out the code, write down the decisions that you make while you're actually creating new graphs. And it'll allow you to think very differently about what you're actually creating. Quick summary of the, uh, the seven steps here. So left, we've got all the R, the, the codes, again, using my, my least before. Right, we've got the Tableau, uh, and slightly color-coded this. So these are relatively easy to do, both in Tableau and in R. They're kind of the basics, the things that you can start to do very quickly to analyze your data. Um, later on, this gets a bit more time-intensive, particularly for the polar coordinates at, uh, in Tableau. It requires a bit more knowledge of how things work, table calculations, and so on. Um, but there are seven steps that you can write down, they're quite easy to, to remember, and feel free to take photo if you need to. Uh, there are things that you can use to kind of guide you when you're actually working through your design of your, your graphics and thinking about it in a slightly different way. I mentioned I'd, I'd touch on theme, and I've put on a couple of things that I often use as inspiration. So Tableau Public, for those that haven't looked on it, is a wonderful place for uh, finding inspiration. They've got their biz of the day. You can scroll through all of those. You can have a look at the people that uh, others follow. So go and have a look on their profiles. And, and uh, I think the key thing about it is that you can actually then download their workbooks onto your own machine and start to reverse engineer how some, some people have uh, done some of the magic that you see. And then the R graph gallery, that is it's more for, for coders. You can get uh, R, Python, and D3 graphs, um, examples of them in different scenarios and so on. And then the theme, there's a whole lot. So the theme kind of has its own grammar. I think when I'm, when I'm working with R graphs, it, it's got its own grammar of all the different things that you can do, <coughs> changing panel colors, changing borders, and so on. Color, adding titles and captions to really bring the final visualization so that it's ready for, to be consumed either by um, an audience in, in the press, in the news, in journalism, or if it's a business dashboard, if you're uh, making those final touches so that it looks appealing, people want to engage with it and want to take action off the back of it. So, to wrap things up, um, key takeaways. We spoke about passion right at the start, and that is something that can drive uh, your learning. When you're starting out with a tool, um, I remember using R briefly while I was at university, but only in the last six, 12 months, I've actually got really back into it to help me understand um, how to use it. And that, subsequently, has, has had an effect on the way that I use tablets. So, that is actually quite true as well, but, uh, the way that you can use different tools, even if you're just understanding them at, at a conceptual level, rather than having to write down the actual code, because it can be challenging if you've not worked with code before. Um, but actually understanding how the concepts of creating visualizations using these different tools can um, obviously complement the way that you work with other tools such as Tableau. Um, and then the big one of this is, is actually breaking it down into those seven steps. So, when you're, next time you're creating a visualization, think about, instead of just uh, kind of sprawling over it and creating something right from the start, break it down into those steps. Think about 
how you're working with uh, the aesthetics, whether you're bringing mm -hmm. different parts of the data in, think about whether you want to facet it or whether you want to turn it into a radial chart and so on. So with that, that is everything. Um, thank you again to, to Juan for, uh, for hosting tonight and all the other people who are listening to it. And uh, thanks for listening.